In my mission to make every corner of the world awesome, I first began with one person, then hundreds, then thousands, and now hundreds of thousands. And that is how we will build this universe into a megalopolitan of awesome people. For much of my mission as a peak performance coach for teams and individuals, I have taken every opportunity to learn from the stories and wisdom of great people. There is so much of the universe to take from them, and this is the best way to bring these stories together to heal, to strengthen, to awaken, to inspire, and to transform. And even though we still face difficulties of today and tomorrow, we continue to wake up and move our dreams every day with courage and strength. Welcome to Awesome People, a show that aims to shift the energy of the universe to a higher level through the work and stories of game changers and magic makers. It is our hope that through the course of a single conversation, the world moves for you, that you shine a light to stoke your fire. Congratulations, kudos to you and the entire World Stage team. Fired up and ready to go! the lessons that uh, Cherry and their team uh, imparted to us. So I was quite happy, I'm very happy with uh, the output. Thank you to Coach Cherry and her awesome World Stage International team. May you continue keeping the world fired up and ready to go. Again, thank you World Stage, you are awesome. In today's episode of Firecast Live, How to Be Fired Up Six Feet Apart, I bring you the movers and shakers of the fire walking industry. They are the empowerment coaches who have brought a lot of people on a journey to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit of fire so that they could achieve their own breakthrough stories. Please welcome to the House of Awesome, Rolf and Ossa Beckman from Sweden. They have trained under Tony Burkan and Peggy Dillon and they have combined the power of ecology and psychology of bringing the environment and the power of breakthrough coaching in the whole narrative of the fire so that they could actually make awesome work with people. Next up is Steve Consalves. He is actually called the Simon Cowell of Empowerment by bringing his candor to the field of transformation and fire walking. He has helped Tony Robbins and Tali Burkan bring fire walking to the United Kingdom and has trained and has been trained under Richard Bandler and John Grinder. Finally, please welcome to the House of Awesome, Barry Collins, co-trainer and director of Fire Walking United Kingdom, trained under Richard Bander on NLP and Tony Burkan of Fire Walking in 2015 after walking on a bed of coals, find his great freedom and started to actually utilize the power of fire walking to train and provide breakthrough stories to a lot of people. Please welcome to the House of Awesome, four of my greatest teachers and friends, Barry, Asa, Rolf, and Steve. Welcome to the House of Awesome. I am here with four great, wonderful, fired up people. It's getting very hot here because we are here on fire. So I am very blessed to be visited by these four great people who are the fathers and mother of fire walking, the gurus of breakthrough change so please welcome straight from europe my friend steve say hello steve consalves there's steve everyone. there hello. and hello and there's rolf and ossa beckman uh, beckman yes hello how are you over there from sweden Hi. excellent thank you yes and there's barry over there from scotland hello barry i think barry is frozen Hi. Hello, Barry. Hello. Thank you. So, 
Thank you so oh. much. Uh, I am very honored and very blessed to have you, to welcome you here in the Philippines. Uh, uh, the, the people of the Philippines and the fired up people all over Asia are all very excited to actually have your souls with us. Thank you so much for spending this afternoon with us. Thank you so much, my dear friends. These are my comrades, my fire brothers and fire sister. Thank you so much for coming all over the world and visiting us here in Asia. I'm so blessed to have your fired up souls with us and we are here to make great conversation. So how are you? How are you right now? From youngest to eldest, who wants to begin? Who's the youngest here? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I guess that might, I'm, I'm going to claim that one and, and whether it's right or wrong. I'm very well. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, loving the challenges that we've been set at the moment and uh, looking forward to how we can continue to grow and learn from all of these. But yeah, I'm good. Uh, I'm happy and healthy. Wonderful. Who's next? <laughs> Well, gosh, that might be me. This is Steve from the United Kingdom uh, saying hi to everybody. I'm good. I'm really enjoying this period of blessing where we can reflect. And I'm looking forward to joining everybody on the call. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve. And here we go with a fa my father and mother, my second father and mother. Okay, Rolf and Asa. Oh, we are fine here in Sweden. We are doing well. And uh, we are happy to be part of this uh, meeting with you to connect heart to heart with Philippines and all the people that you are uh, helping and encouraging. Yeah, you, and Rolf, yeah. nice to be on here. Nice to see you again, Sherry. Nice to uh, see you, Rolf. Yeah. Yeah, it was a year ago we met in England at the firework gathering, almost a year. So I'm looking forward to this, this moment here with you and your colleagues in, in the Philippines. Yes, yes, thank you. And Asia, okay, there's a lot of people from Asia watching us. So All right. thank you. All thank right. you so much for bringing your souls here. I'm really very interested because this is a wonderful time to actually just ask firewalkers who are, you know, fortified by fire to ask you how you are. My first question, how are your souls? You know, this is a very trying time for not just our bodies, but also for our souls. So how are my great firewalking comrades coping with this great challenge of the universe? Yes, <laughs> it's always observing, isn't it? It doesn't matter the circumstances. The soul is just observing and, and stalking how the ego deals with the situation. So the soul mm -hmm. is just fine. The soul is, are you busy right now? Are you working or spending great time with uh, Olaf here? Osa? Uh. Are you working? <laughs> that's that's a question that is really. <laughs> we, we, are we, are, we are living on a farm, and that uh -huh. is uh, sort of. Uh, uh, and because of that, life is very normal being living on a farm, and uh, in Sweden we have lots of space too, so that makes not a very big difference with uh, this. And I believe that the corona is in many ways a, a blessing uh, because it's, it's a step to a new world and we will take a big step, a big leap uh, uh, through this, this uh, crisis and the challenges we are going through. When you said that corona has a message for us, what do you think is the message for us here, Asa? You know that nature is my, my, the earth. I know. <laughs> yes. And uh, Corona is a part of that knowledge that the earth has for us. And she, the earth is telling us something that we have to wake up and uh, take care. And we are so blessed that we have this new opportunity with the, um, that we can connect all over the world through this, uh, um, technical help we have like Zoom. Mm. And, yeah. So we can be connected and still and take care of the earth at the same time. I think that's yeah. a very new thing in, the, in our history. 
And I, I, I remember what you told me, right? When you actually, you know, wrote uh, something on my Facebook, you said that Corona is actually not an enemy. It's actually part of us, right? And it's sending a powerful message to us. And I think one of the blessings that this particular situation has given us is the chance to actually just come together. This would probably not have happened without Corona, right? So thank you so much yeah. for, your, for bringing your bodies and soul to us. It's nice, you know, reunion for, for all of us, you know, after one year. <laughs> See you all. So I'm very blessed right now. My soul is blessed. What about you, Barry? Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm blown away uh, because the, the, you know, as, as Osa touched on, the very technology that for the better part of the last decade has been causing disconnect, uh, you know, in, in most societies, is now the one thing that is is providing the opportunity for people to reconnect perhaps, you know, deeper than, than previously. And so, you know, I think it's really good that we, we've had this opportunity almost to, to reboot, to, to, you know, disconnect, plug back in and reevaluate how we connect with other people, how we connect with those closest, nearest and dearest to us and how much we, we value. You know, I, I know just very yesterday, uh, I was able to see my, my daughters and granddaughters for the first time in 10 weeks. Um, you know, in the flesh, other than electronically, and so you you value that connection far more. And I think this this opportunity for us to kind of reevaluate how important those connections are, and whether we're now doing that face to face or in this instance electronically, I think you know it's less about the technology and it's more about the personal connection, and and that's you know really good. Uh, I've found that a really valuable lesson, and being able to take the time for me to reflect on that, to reset, recharge, re-energize, so that when we come back at the other end of this, we're able to, to serve people even better and in you know, new ways, perhaps. And that's wonderful, right? To reconnect in a totally different way. Things that we take for granted, finally we give importance to it. And this is the message of the fire to us, the message of this entire huge fire happening in our planet right now. Thank you so much. Steve! <laughs> my soul is really happy right now because I was working so hard previously and now I've had this opportunity to just settle my mind and decide what it is I want to do. And so this has provided the ideal example. I too live on a, a little sort of farm acreage and so that's growing like crazy. So it's really given me an opportunity to get back to the earth and to think about what we want to be doing in the next five or ten years. And so it's been actually a really great experience for me. <laughs> and thanks to the work that we've done, especially with Barry, over the last two or three years, we're now in a great place to be really positive for the future. So we're doing loads of things for the firewalking community and for the people of the United Kingdom. I like that, to be in a great place to actually start to do things positively. Sometimes, you know, we are in this, you know, in this industry where we help souls to be positive, but sometimes with the things happening all over, we also need time to recharge. It's a wonderful time to recharge. And I'm very blessed to be with your positive souls. I could feel it. We need that right now, right? Because there's a lot of negativity around us, a lot of helplessness. Uh, we need this kinds of spirit and fire to just, you know, make us, you know, go back to the very basic and remember how fired up we are and, and the power of all of this. You know, I, uh, I, I wanted to just, you know, touch on the concept of fire walking because something that's not very common here in Asia, right? I mean, we talk about change work. We talk about a lot of seminars doing this, but not fire walking. In fact, when I was doing one of the seminars, uh, one of the attendees, uh, thought that this was really just a metaphor until the very end that he actually saw fire right before his eyes. So tell us more about the work that you were doing prior to this uh, corona thing. I mean, tell us more about fire walking, at least in your area of um, expertise in your own countries and regions. Well, certainly here in the UK, um, one of the things that we found through you know the, these international meetings and, and discussions and gatherings is that one of the things that's quite uncommon here in the UK is that the, the challenge events and specifically fire walking 
are commonly associated with charitable causes and as a, used as a means for fun. And certainly here in the UK, we were, we were blown away by how unique that was. And, you know, so th this is something that we're, we're now looking at. Well, how can we use this uh, as a tool outside of the UK uh, to, you know, to, to help people raise funds for causes that are maybe not going to be looking at going forward while continuing to, to support the, the causes and uh, associations that we do here in the UK. What about you, Steve? Uh, yeah, we we pretty much was were bringing firewalks to those who we knew were really looking for it. But I think moving forwards, we're going to be taking our various skills uh, to do with NLP and therapy and stress and anxiety and those sort of uh, things, hypnosis. And I think we're going to be really building them into new and different courses. I started out doing that, bizarrely, uh, 26 years ago, um, using firewalking as a metaphor on top of everything else. And so now I think it's kind of come full circle. So Barry and I are going to be really working on our propulsion course, our ignition course, uh, to make to make that unique and to bring in all of the skill sets that we've developed over this period. So it's exciting and, you know, it, it's great that finally after 30 years I can start to do this work. <laughs> yeah, you've been very busy outside, right? Doing the fires, the coals and everything. So it's really a chance to recharge and, uh, you know, try and expand more the services that you're doing in order to actually help people break through more. That's wonderful. What about yeah. over there in Sweden? Uh, yeah, well, fire walking is uh, very interesting because in a way it's... Um, it's a, it's a major thing. I mean, historically, firewalking has been gone all over the planet for, I mean, who knows how long. Pre-recorded history, probably, uh, let's, say, let's say man tamed fire, um, let's say 500,000 years ago. I'm sure it didn't take m many generations before as a, you know, as a ritual event, Somebody started to dance on the coals, uh, <clears throat> and it's been and it's been um, going on all over the planet ever since that. And now the modern form is just you know a new custom for fire walking. And in in two thousand years, it will still be there. It's probably the oldest uh, ritual alive on the planet, uh, except maybe for praying. Um, <clears throat> And it's always been done in the in you know with the idea to show the people, or not really show them that to, to let them have an experience that what they think is impossible is indeed not impossible at all. That our mind sets the limits for uh, for what's what's possible to achieve, and it's such a great tool to uh, to use because you don't have to put yourself in the you know, in the fore, in, 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 in front of people. You, I mean, you have to be there to facilitate. You have to talk about, the, you know, the, the qualities of the fire and what to do and what not to do. But basically, the fire is the teacher. So everybody who chooses to walk on the fire, and even people who choose not to walk on the fire, they will get a teaching just, just by making that decision to walk. And for some people who come to, to a firewalk, it's a life-changing experience for just, you know, a three-hour event because they can never go back. They have done something that really feels impossible. And, uh, I mean, it's the same for us, as you know, even if we have done walk, firewalk, I don't know, if it's thousands of times or hundreds of times. No, it's not probably not thousands of times, but at least hundreds of times, depending on your count, I guess. But anyway, <laughs> many, many times. Even, even so, every time you stand in front of, you know, 500 degrees Celsius cold bed, you think, man, is this really possible? And then you get sort of into a different mindset and boom, you can walk over. Even if it's 10 meters long, you can walk over with no problem. And the, and the, and the deep understanding and healing 
that takes place is really something that um, people have have a huge benefits from. So it's it's really a blessing to have this uh, as a as a tool uh, to help people evolve. I like what you just said, Rolf, here, that the fire is our teachers, right? Uh, we cease to be the teachers in front of the fire, and we really are just the MCs of their transformation. Right? Exactly. I mean, how powerful that fire is. And there's a lot of vulnerability when you say that, right? If you are not vulnerable, it is very difficult to actually forge through the fire and succeed. Uh, right now, we are crossing our biggest fire as a group of people, as humanity. What is this fire teaching us? What is it telling us? You mean the pandemic? What is the pandemic mm -hmm. telling us? Yes, yes. Well, that's our choice, isn't it? We can, uh, I mean, we create our own reality. So we can, we can yes, choose what, it, what we want to, uh, what, it, what we want it to, to mean. And uh, I think it's a really, really important choice that we as, uh, you know, humans have to make. Because we have shown uh, the enormous uh, potential for decisiveness that we have. I mean, we've, sh we've shut down the entire world in a way that I would never have thought would be possible. So and now we're talking about, you know, getting back to the normal or something like that, getting over this. And I really, really hope and pray that that's not going to happen. If we go back to normal, we are facing a catastrophe way much bigger than the coronavirus. This would be nothing. And this is just in decades. We're gonna, the whole fire is all, already burning. And uh, there's all the pollution, there's all the climate change, there's all these really, really bad things that we have, and, and you know, the killing of the other species on the planet which you know, destroys the ecological web and at some point it can just collapse and won't be able to. So we really have to figure out what are we going to learn from this. And uh, I agree with Osa, we have to change. We have to come back to the res respect of the feminine, of the respect of the earth. Otherwise, we're going to be so much <laughs> put out of business. That's my thought. So, and you hear, you hear some voices. Of course, you hear voices saying, now when we restart this, we have to restart it in a, in a conscious way. Uh, but you also hear like, just let us go back to normal. Just let us, you know, start our business and go on as we did before, you know, running as fast as we can to the abyss. So, I don't know. This is a chance. That's for sure. This is a chance for us to realize we have to change. But if we can take it, I don't know if we're going to take it. I, I don't know. So there's no going back to normal, right? It's going to be different. For, it must be different. There is a message that this virus is telling us. It we must has listen. to be different. It has to be different. There's no going yes. back to normal. There's no going mm -hmm. back to normal if we want to survive. And it just like the it fire. Yeah. Right, right. And I, I, I believe that the human spirit is built to actually receive this and take this if we only listen, right? Uh, when you are forged in fire, once you have crossed the fire, there's no turning back. You become a different person at the end of the fire bed. What about the message to you, Barry and uh, Steve and Asa? What's the message of this fire to you, to this world, to our planet? Well, to, to continue your analogy of, you know, th this is our, our greatest fire that we have to cross. I, I've heard it said that, you know, the fire cannot burn you. It can only burn what you are not. And I think this is a chance for us to kind of shed all those pretenses and facades and roles that we, we play and fulfill. And it, it's a chance to, to become, the, you know, the best versions of ourselves individually and as societies by you know letting go of all the the the, the mishigos the complicated nonsense the the all the things that hold us back and tie us down so that we can you know raise our consciousness raise our vibration and you know th th i think this is part of an evolution it has to be 
you know, that we've been provided this opportunity and, you know, we, we have to be, you know, as firewalkers, we have to lead that revolution um, and show people the, the, the way to move forward because people will, I think, by default, unless shown an alternative, they will try to go back to what they know, what they believed was comfortable and, and what they, they felt at home with, whether it was good or bad for them. It was it was familiar. It was known, and so I think you know we have a role to, to play in this, which is to to show the way to, to open the door for people who perhaps can't find it otherwise. Ah, for for the benefit of everybody, when we talk about firewalking, this is real firewalking, right? It is not a metaphor here. These people have walked many many times, hundreds of times, right, in the bed of hot fire, hot coals, right, thousand two hundred degrees, uh, and uh, so their spirits are alive and strong. Their bodies are resilient, so they are built for this kind of other fire uh how are we built for this steve i mean uh, how is the human soul built uh, because as a result of the fire walking the many the hundreds of fire walkings that you've done well <clears throat> I, I, one of the things that i used to teach many many years ago was fire walking in the context of goals and mm. objectives and achieving objectives because once you've faced your fear and walked through coals knowing that it could burn you and even if it did you realize that the journey through it is that much bigger than whatever fear that you are putting into it and i think what this current situation is teaching us that we need to pass on is that people need a, a bigger picture and they need longer term thought processes because you know I've been here now I think 12 years and I've grown trees and sometimes you have to ignore the droughts and you have to ignore the frosts and you have to have a longer view and the world has got so bogged down with needing things now and seeing things now and hearing things now that the news is scary I don't watch the news anymore because it's just too scary you know the media is throwing all this stuff of us and I think people that aren't us get sidetracked by the fear of everyday life and so for, for me what I think our job is is to get people back onto a path of what it's like to be them for their lives so that the short-term things that come and hit us, like COVID and other epidemics that are bound to come along, that, that you know, we can get past that. And instead of getting drawn into all this drama, we should live our life's purpose. And so I think our job is to help people find their life's purpose so that these short-term things that come along, they understand that they don't need to have the drama within them because they're, they've, they've got a purpose for their life. And I think that's the mission that I'm getting from this, is our job is to help people to understand that there's a life to live and that these things are going to come along the way. And fire walking is a way of massively getting people to understand that, you know, that their life's purpose is out there and they can overcome this. They can, they can overcome four paces, they can overcome six months. I think in all of these challenges, you know, the message of the fire to us is that we are actually forged in fire and we are built to actually overcome all of this. We are strong people, right? Yeah. What's next? I mean, uh, we, it's, you know, when we all go back to a normal, uh, we don't know when that's going to be, right? What's next for fire walking? I mean, do you foresee, for example, fire walk to still be a useful metaphor for change and empowerment? Well, I do because for the first, I don't know, 100 firewalks, every single one was different. I had a different mindset. I had a different mood. I was thinking different things. And every time I did it, it was like building a muscle. And so firewalking, especially if you respect the fire and you have the feet, you accept the feelings and the vulnerability 
as you go through. Each time you go through, it helps solve and build resolve. And so to me, fire walking is more than a metaphor. You know, the more that you do it, the more, I would say, amazement that you build into your body and your cellular body about what you're capable of. That's what it is for me. And that's kind of, you know, that's what I'm, I, I want to get out to everybody, you know, it, it build it in at the cellular level. How many times have you firewalked, Steve, in your whole life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whose uh, who <laughs> feet are the most, you know, resilient here? <laughs> well, you know, the gathering has taught me, <laughs> the gathering... <laughs> Has, has taught me to always respect the fire. I'm, I'm at somewhere between 970 and 980. I, I need a fit, I think, the fire walk instructor training program. I need to just do my final 30 or 40 just to get over that thousand mark. Wow. <laughs> All right. So you're going to do that, whether with other people or yourself, you're just going to cross that thousand mark, right? It's going to be a personal breakthrough for you, Steve. But about the rest, how many times have you firewalked? And what has the fire taught you? I mean, these are real firewalkers, my friend. They have walked to the bed of coals, a thousand two hundred degrees Celsius of fire. Their spirits are strong, forged by fire. But, you know, uh, these are people who have actually done a lot of breakthrough work for people. Uh, people People enabling people. I'm very proud of this group. I mean, what is the fire? What is the message of this fire? And how many times have you firewalked out of curiosity? Barry? Uh, I, I think at last count, it was somewhere around 350 or so. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's about, you know, as, as Steve said, it's, it's building that muscle. And that muscle for me is resilience. And, you know, to, to answer the previous question as well, which is, you know, what is the, the role for firewalking going forward? I think it's that people will recognize the need for that personal resilience. Those that have come through this relatively unscathed and those that have really struggled to, to come through these times, either way will recognize the, the, the importance and the benefit of having that, that resilience as part of who you are. And so if, if we can provide people the opportunity to build that muscle, to, to develop that resilience, whether it's simply a seed in them at the moment or if it's something, a work in progress, it provides the opportunity for them to, to build that resilience so that for whatever challenges come in their life beyond uh, you know, the, this year, next year and, and beyond that, they are prepared, if not specifically for the challenge, but within themselves for whatever life throws at them. Uh, to me, I don't count how many times I walk on fire for, because to, to me, it's to me, the fire spirit is the deepest. It really connects with my soul, the fire and the connects to my soul. And uh, I, that's why I don't count it. And the, just to be with the fire and sometimes I walk and sometimes I just stand by and look at the fire. Yeah, I think, you I, I think uh, we facilitate the fire walk between 10, 20 times every year. And, uh, and uh, I've been fire walking regularly since 19, first time I fire walk was in 1983. But then I didn't do it again until 89. But from there, I would say 10 or 20 times every year. But on the other hand, you know, sometimes you walk on, on one, if you, for instance, dance on the fire, you have a round fire coal bed, and you, you, maybe, you maybe are on the fire 100 times in one night. So it would depend on how you would count. That's what I say. I would, you know, it could be thousands of times, or it could be like 300 or 400 times or something like that. But I, but I, uh, when I was in 1965, I was 14 years old and I was looking at television with my father and we were looking at, um, you know, Candid Camera, the early version of, of, you know what Candid Camera is when they fool people with, with, uh, with, with the setup. And, and, 
and there was this uh, sequence where they had taken out the engine of a car and pushed it down downhill so just had it just had enough power to to um, roll into a gas station and there was a woman of course that then by, behind the wheel and she goes out and she knocks at the you know she goes into the station and she says you know the, the car doesn't work can you come and help me and then this guy comes out and you know it's gonna help her with the car and he opens you know the car and there's no engine so he goes to the back of the car and he looks and there's no engine there so he goes and fetches his body inside the store and the body comes out you know so, uh, we're gonna help this you know and they look there's no engine in the car and she says you have to help me i have to move on you know the car went just fine and then it suddenly stopped and so they can't find an engine in the car and they go back in they go back into the little hut and uh, she's like, As, please help me, please help me. And they say, we can't find an engine. Then they take down the, you know, the thing that says closed on the, on the, on the door. And I was 14 and I realized this is, this is reality. And that's where I became a firewalker. You know, in that exact moment, I realized this is my mission. This is what I have to do because I realized this is happening constantly around me in my family, my friends, in school, people, when, as soon as they encounter something that is not fitting into their construction or what they believe life to be, they take down that sign and says closed and they don't want to take it in. So what we do is we try to open, you know, open up again, open up, receive the mystery of life. And, and, you know, and we use the fire so that people can understand that life is much bigger than any thought construct that we have and this is so important of course because also for not only on an individual level but we can actually change we we still can change as a species and and um, respect and uh, understand that we are depending on on nature and on one another instead of instead of uh, fighting nature and one another so that's that's how we basically use the firewalk to say, hey, look, this is impossible. What else do you think is impossible? Do you think peace is impossible? Do you think it's impossible to live in a happy marriage? Do you think it's impossible to, you know, to have a rewarding job? What else do you think is impossible? Walk on this fire. Maybe you can redefine what you think is possible or not. And like what you're saying, right? When we, you know, tend to be very limited by our own mindsets and beliefs and then you accept the fire in your life and all of a sudden just things just open up for you and new possibilities. I mean, who would imagine a person to walk on fire, right? A thousand two hundred degrees Fahrenheit of coals, but you're able to do it. Are you still I have a question, do you still get scared of the fire? Are you still I mean a thousand times close to a thousand times for Steve? Do you still get scared of the fire? I would say I get deeply respectful. Um, I never take it for granted anymore. Uh, I've tried that and the fire taught me various lessons. So yeah, I'm, I, I wouldn't say it's fear because I wouldn't walk with fear, I don't think. I might, you know, unless it was for an experiment, but I still get the energy and the fire gives me the energy, but I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't walk in fear. I would make sure that I get my spirit, raise my spirit, raise my energy, get deep respect for the fire, um, and then, and then, and then I walk. Uh, and sometimes I get it wrong. Uh, at the gathering, I completely forgot that I had an injury, and took two steps on the fire, and then realised my arch and my in my foot had, you know was injured and so I got a sudden pain and that brought me out of my state and you know so I got a little kiss from that so I'm I'm deeply respectful of fire walking 28 years or 29 years has taught me that I think there's also a message there, right? When there's fire and you take it for granted, uh, you get hurt. And that's also a very important message to us, right? So we need Every to time. listen to... 
correct. Uh, just like this fire that we're experiencing right now, we need to listen to the message of this fire and mm-hmm. you know, the human spirit, the resilient human spirit is actually going to give us the answers. What about Barry? You still get scared of the fire? Or what does the fire tell I- you every time you go? Again, I, I, I wouldn't say it was fear. Uh, I think maybe the first once or twice, you know, before I, I'd become an instructor, you know, I approached it with certainly a, a great deal of trepidation and probably a little bit of fear, but also a great degree of trust in the person who had, had led me to the fire in the first instance. But now I would say when I approach the fire, it's, it's always very much with the the consciousness of being brought back to being fully present in the current moment. So Mm -hmm. all the the, the thought and diversion of the future, the past, the worries, the concerns and doubt and hesitation, all of that, if you take that with you onto the fire, you will receive a lesson. And so for me, it's very much about being in the present moment. And the the, the fire is, is the way to bring you back to that moment. It requires your full attention. It requires you to be focused 100% both on yourself and on the fire so that you know who you are as you approach the fire and to, to be you know, in, connected with your own spirit, your, your own authenticity so that you, you are your best self when you go to the fire uh, and you approach it with, you know, for me it's, it's with that humility, it's with that respect um, and sometimes, yeah, you know, it'll challenge me. Uh, I get that and, you know, I look for the lessons in that. I like that, right? The vulnerability and the respect for the fire, right? That there is something bigger than us. And when you actually approach it with arrogance, you get hurt. But when you approach it with awe, you know, there's a message. I mean, despite a thousand times of walking on fire, there's got to be some message of this fire, right? And it has forged your human spirit, our human spirits to the level of where, you know, we could possibly contribute as a result of this, you know, this crisis thing, as a result of this fire, we're able to actually share more of this positivity, of this strength, and of this humility to actually listen to what nature is telling us. Prof and Asa, what about you? Do you still get scared of the fire or what is the fire telling you? I, I think awe is, a, is the right word for me uh, when I getting it close to the fire. It's sort of, yes. I, I think Barry put the words on, on how I feel for, for the fire. I get scared every time. <laughs> every time. It doesn't matter that I've been in front of all these hundreds or fires. It doesn't matter. It's so powerful and it's so hot. But yes. uh, what we teach, what we teach is uh, overcoming fear. And we're helping people um, not to understand, to understand fear, which is really, uh, has been um, sort of, a, what do you call it, a, a mix, a mixed up in, in people's minds, because there's nothing wrong with fear. Fear is a good thing. It protects us from, you know, doing stupid things. And, uh, but then we have become fearful of things that are actually not dangerous at all. So, and in order to understand how fear works, you have to feel your fear and accept your fear. And, and when you do that, and you can understand it, and you can reflect on it, and you can, you know, transform it to some, something else. So it's, it's a process. When you, when you stand in front of the fire, you can feel that fear. I feel that fear, at least. And <clears throat> if, if I don't evolve, if I don't pass through that membrane of fear, I don't walk. Because I don't have to walk. Uh, sometimes I'm, I do, sometimes I don't. Most of the times when you're an instructor, you have a lot of uh, responsibilities you have to think about and you have to look out for the people who are there for the first time and don't know their way around the fire. So there, there might not be you know, space for yourself to uh, feel what's right for me to do. But uh, the, the process looks the same for me. Uh, first, I feel fear if I stand, wow, this is too hot. You know, I can't <laughs> walk on this. And then I sort of go a little deeper in myself and I start to feel like, well, behind that fear, maybe there's actually a big joy, you know, which is 
the case in many, uh, around many things in life. Behind that fear, there's a big joy. People really fear things that, that uh, are not dangerous at all. You know, one of the most uh, things that, that people fear the most is public speaking, which, you know, normally 99% of the time, there's nothing dangerous with that at all. It's, it's actually a, a great thing to stand in front of people and sharing what's in your heart and what you think is important to say. But instead, people, you know, get fearful and the fear kicks in. So, um, so uh, understanding fear and how to use fear and how to transform the energy of fear into power is actually one of the basic fundaments of our teachings. And, uh, you know, as an instructor, you have the privilege of uh, being, you know, able to train that spiritual muscle every time you're around the fire yourself too. So that's one of the gifts of being an instructor. I think it's, it's, it's very reassuring, Rolf, to actually hear that from you, right? Uh, somebody who's, who looks to be a, so strong, so forged in fire, still get fearful. And what you said, right? We have to listen to our body. We have to listen to our soul. It is okay to be afraid because fear is our ally. It's telling us something. But when we stop at the face of fear, we miss out on the opportunity to experience something brilliant at the end of the fire. So I guess, you know, uh, the fear is there, but the courage must be bigger, right? And I also like what you said that, you know, sometimes uh, you listen to your body and to your own fear and not cross if it's too hot, for example. Uh, these are people who really walk on fire, right? 1,200 degrees uh, Celsius of fire, it's hot. Uh, and it's just actually reassuring and comforting to hear that, you know, despite the thousand times, the hundreds of times that you walk on fear that you still get scared, right? Uh, are you scared now? I mean, with all of these things happening around the world with businesses, you know, uh, taking a back seat, uh, do you even feel any kind of fear or any degree of fear in your soul? Yeah, I, I do at least. As I said before, there's nothing wrong with being fearful. It's just an emotion. And there's mm -hmm. information in the emotion. Uh, so I don't, I don't differentiate, dif differentiate between different feelings they're all they're all valid and they're all good so you there's there's nothing wrong with feeling fear and of course you can feel fear i mean my biggest fear in this situation is that we will not learn anything from it that mm. we as humans wow. the big society yes. will not mm. understand that we have to change our way of living We've been living on this a, a, a fantastic level of uh, comfortability and traveling and whatnot that we do, which is not sustainable. Sorry, we cannot do that. I mean, uh, if, we had, if, we had, if we had changed our ways 30 years ago, when the environmentalists started to say, this will not be possible, we have to change. If we had, you know, changed... 2% a year, but instead, I get really scared when I have people talking about growth, economical growth as the solution to the predicaments of, of, of the human. Because human growth, or economical growth, I mean, is not possible yet through technical e uh, evolution and effect, you know, making things more effective. It is also a price for, for the planet and for nature. So when mm -hmm. people think that is the solution, that we need, you know, 5% growth every year, that really scares me a lot that we haven't uh, come to a bigger understanding of our predicament and what we have to do. And we can do it. I mean, we see now that we can do it. Uh, and it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be as extreme as it is now but we have to do something and we have to turn it's too much talk and too little action around this still and that scares me you know, we, you? Have, you know we, we have grandchildren we want to leave a planet for our children and our grandchildren and we, we don't want to be the last generation so you know, well we we destroyed the whole thing and then we died you know. good luck with that Mm -hmm. So, of course, that scares me, yeah. 
are, are you feeling positive about this? I mean, what is the future like for us, uh, Rolf? I mean, hearing how, you know, the message of the entire thing, right, to us, uh, to humanity. Is there hope for us? Hope is a very interesting thing. I mean, hope, uh, hope you need hope to to um, to summon up energy for action if you have no hope uh, you don't do anything so you need hope so i'm hopeful against better judgment i would say <laughs> i i when i see when i see the leaders of the world today and understand that people actually vote for these leaders they're not even dictators, uh, you know, uh, on their thrones by power of the armies, but they're actually uh, voted. People actually vote for, for, for these people. And they're just horrible people. I mean, you can just see it after two minutes looking, what, the, what, is, what is this? What is this person? They're just, you know, sociopaths, just wanting power and influence. They have nothing they want to give to the people. And there's so many of them, and they're getting more and more every day, it seems, all over the planet. So how can, you know, and there's so few speaking in, in you know, in the other direction. And the people, and they, those who do, they're not very powerful. I mean, they don't have any. But on the other hand, things can change like that. It's not much. It's not much of a rotation that is needed in the human mind to change this for the better. I mean, there's so many things going on on the small scale and, you know, maybe under the level. That's this, what we are doing here. There's so much of this going on all the time, all over the world, that at one point suddenly, bang, you know, it may change. And people will say, I, I will not have anything to do with this anymore. We want responsible leaders who service the people. And if they don't service the people, you know, we're going to, vote them out or throw them off their thrones. So, yes and no, <laughs> would, would be the, the answer. But skepticism is also a positive energy, right? I like what you're saying, that there is hope for us. Uh, there is hope for us. There's a message for all of us here. And all we need to do is to listen well to what our environment, our nature is telling us. And I, I guess what, you know, to be forged by fire, the strength of our inner fire, the resilience, right? To get through this and, uh, you know, to build a better, you know, world again. So we're not going back to what the world used to be. It's never, there's no turning back, right? I mean, we're all just moving forward. It's up to us. Uh, how we manage this and how we listen to the message of the world, uh, it's all up to us. What about Steve and Barry? Uh, I mean, what's the hope here? I mean, what is the message of this entire, you know, pandemic telling us? And how can our fire actually, you know, what, what, how do we listen to this fire, to our fire, so that we could actually emerge a better group of people from this pandemic? Um, I, I, I agree with Rolf in, in terms of what he just said. And I think at the same time, we have to have a realization as the individuals that we are. You're doing amazing work over there and you're touching people. And I think the realization that there are billions of people whose mindset we may never get to. And these billions of people are in the most part unspiritual people who just want lower taxes, excellent health care, excellent pensions, you know, lower taxes, lower taxes, um, iPhone, you know, they, they want all of that and they will just vote for that. And I think we need to get to those people, but I think there are billions that we won't. But like the girl with the starfish on the shore, we need to just make sure that the ones that we touch, that we touch as many as we can to open their hearts and minds to the fact that we need to start thinking about our community and about each of us and everybody and that we are a community. And the hope actually for me comes from a selfish perspective, which is 
I'm not going to focus on the billions. I'm just going to try and touch as many people as we can and open up their hearts and minds with firewalking and get them to realize that we're on a bigger planet here and that, you know, our job is to change our leaders and make them more responsible. But at the same time, we have to be positive and not be fearful because if we want things uh, and they're outside of our comfort zone, fear comes up. And when we hear things that are, aren't part of our goals, they, if it's media driven, they make us fearful. And I think as firewalking instructors, it's kind of our duty to just touch as many people as we can to raise their spirit and get them to think beyond their iPhones and beyond their smartphones and beyond asking for lower taxes and, and getting rid of their governments because they don't like what their governments are doing, even if their governments are doing good things. And that's the challenge that we've got, I think, is to, is to help people see the good spirit in each other and in the people that they vote in power. So mm -hmm. I'm going to do as many of, I'm going to touch as many people as I can in a good way. I, I, I like that, right? To just, you know, uh, take it one person at a time. Don't be overwhelmed by the number. And uh, for the people that, you know, whose lives pass by with your life to actually you know, make a positive change. And that's our roles here, right? In this world yeah. to make this better than we found it, make this universe better than we found it. What's your perspective here, Barry? I think, you know, at the outset of this, there was probably 20% of the people who were going to keep doing what they've always done, keep expecting what they've always expected. And for them, nothing, you know, they don't want anything to change at the other end of it. There'll be 20% who at the outset of this saw it as a massive opportunity, the opportunity to reevaluate, to set a new direction, to begin change, you know, on a, a, a national, global scale. And there'd be 60% in the people uh, in the middle who could be swayed either way, given the right set of circumstances. And, you know, I think it, had this not happened, those 60% would, in the main, probably gone along expecting what they've always expected, doing what they've always done. But with this opportunity that we've been provided to, to as Steve said, to, to reach out and touch those lives, to perhaps show them a different way, they could be open to the, you know, opening their hearts, opening their minds, opening their spirits to a new way of existing. And it's, you know, as much as, you know, I would love, as Rolf said, for something to change overnight, you know, the, the, in an ideal world, yes. You know, we would all get up, at, you know, in a month's time and go, you know what, we can't do this anymore. There needs to be something new. But I think what this allows us to do is, if you listen to many of the leaders, yeah, they, they want normal to come back to whatever normal was or their version of a new normal. But I think if you listen to individuals, you know, the people that you and I know, the people we talk to, you know, in, on the internet, or, you know, through messages, on the phone, many of them want change. And I think this is the point where, you know, it's, it's the story of the, the if you set on a, on a journey of a thousand miles and you shift by just one degree, now, a mile down the road, that hasn't made an awful lot of difference. It's made a little bit of a difference. But as you continue that journey, the path strays further from where you would have been to where you're now heading. And I think this is the, the opportunity for us to make that one degree shift. And that might be all it takes at this point in time. And, you know, for our children, our grandchildren, and our grandchildren's grandchildren, for them to experience the benefit of that, yeah, I think right now we have to do something. But it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be, you know, up sticks, disconnect from the power grid, go and live in the woods and, you know, disconnect ourselves from society. I think we just need to make that small shift that allows us to take the first step on a new path.
I like that. Then it becomes less overwhelming, right? When it's just, you know, one degree, you know, one small change, as long as it just move, right? The message here is just move. Don't stay where you are because the world has, you know, it's not going to wait for us. There's going to be major shifts that's going to happen. So we need to actually keep up with the change and listen more to this world. I mean, there's a question here I wanted to answer. Thank you for that, Barry. The question is, uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned a lot about how the fire helps us build that muscle of resilience in your fair walk gatherings and in real life. How can we build this resilience uh, to be refined by fire instead of being burnt by fire? How do we build the muscle of resilience? And, you know, sometimes when we want to just keep forging forward, we get burned by it, right? How do we make sure that we are safe as we try and change our lives and respond to the fire? I, I think in, in one sense, it's about looking at the things that, that challenge you. And, you know, in my experience, I found that people will want change because the, what they're doing now is not is no longer fulfilling them. It's no longer, you know, bringing joy to their hearts. It's no longer um, feeling, making them feel connected to, to that which is greater than they are. And so in some way, their, their comfort zone is no longer comfortable. And so they're looking for something else. And that, that can sometimes be fearful, it can be scary, it can be challenging. But as soon as you recognize that the reason you're looking for it is because you're no longer comfortable in your comfort zone, that, you know, it's that hope that, that Rolf mentioned about with that hope that you can achieve more brings with it the energy, the motivation to step up to that challenge. And it's through continually stepping up to these challenges, each one taking you further from what was your original comfort zone, that we grow, that we become more, that we build that muscle of resilience, in mm. my experience. What about you, Steve? Or, yeah, there you go. Yes, Rolf. Uh, to me, resilience is... There's like different kinds of resilience. It depends on what you want in a way. So if you just want to, if, you're, if your mind is just set on survival at all costs, the resilience is not very, to me, at least not interesting. But if your resilience is based on what you want to give and your vision for life, you will have resilience against, against everything. <laughs> so to speak, because you know what your purpose in life is. You know where you're going to go. And you know at that end of that journey awaits death anyway. But that will not make you deviate from where you're going because your intention, you, you own your intention. And since a lot of people, they have no intention with their life other than, resil that other than to survive from almost on a day-to-day -day basis. They have no, um, you know, deeper thought of what is my gift? What is my purpose? What, why am I here? What should I give to, to this world? And when you have that, your resilience is very, when the only thing you have is survival, the idea that I want to survive because I'm so scared of dying, I want to survive. Then your resilience is uninteresting how, how, how strong or weak it is. But as long, when you have your purpose in life and you made that, you're walking on your decision road. This is who I am. This is my purpose. This is my gift. Then, you know, anything can happen. It doesn't matter because I'm going to be this person anyway. I'm going to be me anyway. So I agree absolutely with, with, with what uh, Steve said uh, before. The most important thing we do is to help people remember their purpose in life that it's actually it's important that you connect with your, with, your, uh, with your purpose, that you understand that you have a vision. Otherwise, you're just like dust under the sofa, you know, you're blown here and there. But as soon as you realize, oh, this is me, this is my purpose, this is where I want to go, this is my vision, this is, wanna, this is, wanna, this is what I want to give, life changes completely.
And it doesn't even, it's not even about results. It's not even if you, if you can, you know, achieve your vision. It's about having that vision. And it doesn't matter if you get it or not. Because when you have a vision, you're totally rich. You live in abundance. This is, this is my vision for life. And <laughs> you can, nobody can take it away. I, I, this, uh, I, I like those two perspectives. Number one, if you have a vision in your life, you are rich, right? Uh, yeah. You are abundant, and that's so important right now. And the other take that I'm uh, receiving here is that resilience is not necessarily a good thing. I mean, no. if you're all the, if it is not, you know, if it doesn't hinge on a strong purpose, it, it is really nothing, right, to just be resilient. So it must come from a very strong intention. We must have pure intentions, and uh, and when our intentions are pure, I guess it's so easy to be resilient and to fight all the obstacles that come our way. And we're just gonna, and if we know our visions and they're pure, we're just gonna know how to get there. And you know, hopefully. As we pass through this journey of life, we make changes, you know, we, we have an impact on the souls of other people so that we do this human humanity some good, right? Uh, do you, I, I want to ask you, do you still get scared? I mean, you look like, you know, strong people forged by fire. I mean, are there a lot of times you get vulnerable or you get scared? Are you scared now with what's to come in our universe? No. <laughs> no, I'm not scared. I'm uh, trust. I have lots of trust that uh, the universe is uh, uh, giving us what we need and that we can create a good, uh, good life on earth so i'm not scared i like that all that we need is in the system in the universe right everything that we need is present so there's nothing more yeah. right yeah. yeah that is very powerful what about the rest what about our big guys here do you still get scared or uh, yeah i think you know uh, a healthy amount of fear is is, is natural what I, I make a point of not doing is allowing fear to to hold me back, to tie me down, uh, and you know, in, in some way, stop me doing things that I want to do or that you know I know will be of benefit to myself or others. So yeah, do I feel fear? Yes. Do I let it control me? No. Yeah, I I agree because I, I love that old quote. Fear is the thing that gets in the way when you take your eyes off your goals. And I just love seeing children, young children, that are looking to overcome something, you know, especially when they want something. They just go around it, they go over it, they'll find different ways of asking the same question, you know. Um, they, they are so resourceful. They just get it in their heads that they want something and then they're just, they just go for it. And, you know, fear is the one thing that, that just gets in the way when you're really not focused on, on, on what you're trying to do. And fear of what's happening right now, it stops, you know, it's the ultimate thing that stops you in your tracks. And I think we owe it to our, the people we're going to touch to embrace the possible and in doing that you know i don't worry about what i can't do anymore uh there are lots of things i can't do anymore and barry knows most of them uh and i don't fret about those things anymore and you know i like you know rolf you know rolf has had an experience just recently there are things probably he's looking to not do anymore to, to look after his health and I don't I don't think you know more the more that people get fearful of those the worse it is and so we need to embrace what we're capable of and, and what is in our hearts and move towards that and I think that's what we're teaching people is to embrace things that are bigger than your fears and Rolf 
gave me a phrase about five years ago, you should stalk your fears. And I love that and I use it regularly because it, it adds a, a level of um, audacity to the things that you're fearful of and, and personal power that you can. And so I think we're teaching people to embrace that mindset and, and, and I don't have fears, but I have acceptance that there are things I may not be able to do, but I don't dwell on them. And, and I don't think we should. I'm going to embrace the things that we can do and I'm going to make sure I give those my best. Well, what about, uh, we are talking about the raw emotion of fear, right? Uh, with what's happened to our world and with what's happened also to your own businesses. I wanted to ask, what is your biggest source of fear, perhaps? I mean, what is your biggest source of worry right now? For me, it's that I'm going to die having not done all the things I want to do. Uh, you know, I don't have a fear of death, but there's so many things I want to do. And I, I've probably got 60 years more thing, life in me to do the things I want to do. But I don't think I'm going to live till I'm 115. You're still very young. So much to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Rolf. Uh, no, I um to me fear is an is an is an ally. All my emotions are allies. They help me to understand uh my situation that I'm in. And uh I I since I'm conscious of my fear when I have it. I can decide what to do with it. Um, and if it's something that I encounter that is really, that I find to be uh, dangerous, I would avoid it. You know, if I'm in a mm -hmm. bar and in the bar comes 10 guys who are severely drunk and have vests with the Hells Angels on their back and they're looking for a fight, I would feel fear and I would go out of the bar, you know. You, you know, just thanking my fear that it sort of warned me. Uh, <clears throat> so, so I would evaluate the fear that I that I would feel at any given situation. But I'm way too old to, um, and I've been passed way through much to have you know worries about things. Uh, so my fear is when I have a fear, it's rational. It's something that has to you know demands my attention. And then I use some of my energy to, you know, ponder on this situation and what to do about it, if anything. And uh, if I can't do anything about it, uh, I just let it go. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna spend my energy and my attention on on worrying about things that I can't, you know, are not in my control. I'd rather <laughs> spend my energy on, you know good things and nice things and things mm. that make me not denying problems that's not what i'm talking about but uh, you know evaluating a, a problem and my emotions around and my thoughts around that problem and so pretty rational answer i suppose but uh, uh can't think of anything else to say about this uh, I, I like it because like there's a lot of you know state management skills here and you know looking at you how you could actually find the message in all of these things happening i like what you said that there are no such thing as negative emotion all the emotions teach you something right and until you know the very end we are all students of our emotions we need to be able to to listen to calibrate our emotions to you know to, to in our in our silence find out what the message of the universe is to constantly do that right i mean when we reach the end, you know, there's nothing much for the world, for the universe to give us. And I, I guess we just need to limitlessly sense for the message around us. So I like what you are sending as vibrations to us. It's very positive to me. Thank you, Rolf. What about you, Barry? Um, I, I, I'm not a warrior, I have to be honest. I, I tend to, you know, I, I, I look at the stuff that happens around us and, and, and happens to me in the way that business is. And the, uh, is everything perfect? No, far from it. You know, I, I 
absolutely uh, embrace that you know that there are things that uh, will challenge us and things that aren't the way that I would like them to be and so if I can I'll take action to change them and if I can't then I just have to kind of accept them because worrying about them isn't going to change it and you know it's it's putting that energy into you know a negative state for me it, it just doesn't it doesn't make sense so I, no, yeah, I, I tend not to worry. Um, sure, I have you know days where I look at stuff and go, no, this isn't the way it needs to be. We need to do something. I need to change something. I need to take action. But the action is not worrying. Um, you know, for me, it's, uh, I've, I've done my share of worrying. I've done my, my share of, of spending time with you know my head in my hands, thinking about all the possible things that could go wrong. And, you know, it must be a really good skill because none of them ever happened. So, you know, I must have been really good at it. But, uh, no, I, I don't worry. And, like, I, I think, you know, the fire has forged you to have spirits that are strong and resilient. Uh, my last question. Do you, do you ever have bad days? <laughs> do you wallow? Are you human? <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. You know, there are days, well, I'll tell you what, the, the, the bad days are far fewer now than they were, you know, before I got into this field. And I think it comes from, um, not just from fire walking specifically, but from self-awareness and recognizing the choices that we have in life, that when you wake up in the morning, you have a choice every single day. And it's when you're oblivious to that choice that you, you just get carried along on the river of life and it takes you where it takes you. But when you wake up in the morning and you recognize your own ability to, to be self-aware, to go, do you know what? doesn't matter what life throws at me. I'm going to make today. I'm going to have a good day today, even if it challenges me, even if I'm fearful, even if it doesn't turn out the way I expected, I'm going to have a good day. And I think it's that level of self-awareness, of recognition of the choice that, you know, makes the, the, the bad days far fewer. And yeah, sure, there'll be moments where I find myself going, oh, oh, wait a minute, what am I, I don't need to be doing this. And so I found that moment of choice again. What about you, Steve? Wonderful. Thank you. Um, do I have bad days? Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, I think, I think I do still have bad moments where I'm maybe so focused on what I, what I want short term and long term that I let the frustration of not getting that in the moment get to me. So... I think maybe as I've got older, I've had, I've, I've, I've got into bad moments and, but I've learned as well. And we teach this is your f number one role is to be a human being. That's your number one role. Then you can be a fire walking instructor or a doctor or a dentist or a teacher or a mother or a father, but be human, accept your humanness. And so I think every now and again, things don't go the way that I want. And so I probably have a little bit of frustration, but I just need to take a walk 50 meters from where I'm sat at home. And I realize how blessed I am. Just mm -hmm. nature. Normally things are very close to you that can just help you release how you're feeling. I'd love to come to the Philippines and see, you know, what nature there is there. But I took some pictures this morning on Facebook, you know, and just melted my heart. So I think I do have bad moments, but I get rid of them pretty quickly. Yes. Uh, not to wallow, right? We're going to make that happen, Steve. We're going to bring all of you to the Philippines. I mean, when the time is right. I mean, when we are ready, we're going to do a lot of fire walking together. I think that will be really fun for us and, and for, yeah. for the people who participate in that. And I think you, have all, you all have wonderful stories to share, and we are bound to just grow listening to your stories. 
Rolf and Asa, do you get scared? Are there still fearful bad days for you? Crash days? Not very much, I would say. I'm, uh, I, I try to be aligned. Uh, and as uh, Steve says, I go out in nature. And as soon as I'm in nature, I get balanced again. So I trust the life force inside me. And I'm so happy for every day I'm on this planet. I know that this is for it. I think it's a magic that I was born and I have this life and I really love to be a human. It continues to be magic and a miracle, right? That we are here strong. Rolf. Uh, now, there's no such thing as a bad day. I, 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 I wouldn't even understand what that is. That doesn't mean that I feel, you know, I can feel or have thoughts or feelings that people would label bad, but I would never, ever label my inner process bad. That is like not a healthy thing to do, I think. I accept every emotion. I accept every thought. Doesn't mean that I act upon them, of course not. But I accept them as, as me, it's my process. So and sometimes life, life is very hard and very full of tragics. People die, people betray you, your, your plans fall like nothing to the ground. And, and if that's what you mean with feeling bad, then of course I feel sad. I can feel angry somebody stepped on my toes, I can be scared if something dangerous comes my way, but these are not bad things. This is my process, and I love my process. I love my life. I love every moment. I respect myself for being who I am and having this process. Not that it's without fault. I mean, sometimes I'm really stupid and don't understand what goes on, but that's also me. That's also me. And I have a right to do this. I don't have a right to do anything, I don't think. I, I should be responsible in my actions. I should be responsible with every word, with every gesture, with every look at anybody. I should be responsible. But my inner process, I, I have entitled to, you know, <laughs> do whatever. <laughs> That's just me going on. That's just me being alive. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that. And I guess if you're able to actually, you know, uh, get the message of this process, everything becomes resourceful, right? Even our bad emotions uh, are helpful to us if we know how to actually, you know, utilize the message of these emotions and, you know, just get better. I like it. Uh, what is next? I mean, I, I know I said that last question. What, 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 what is the future of the firewalking um, community? I mean... Uh, where to now? Where is this fire leading us? I, I know certainly for me it's uh, continuing to you know reach out to people to to bring people to the fire. Uh, you know, Rolf touched on it. You know, five hundred thousand years ago, man tamed fire, and since then, you know, the communities have gathered around the fire. It has been a way of healing, a way of bringing people together. Uh, as a way of joining people in celebration, in community, in togetherness. And I think it's, it's going back to that in some way, but also translating it for the, the, the modern world. And so continuing to, to take the fire to as many people as possible. Through, if, if firewalk is not the answer, if it's not possible to take it in another way, right? Yeah, Very. You know, the, the fire is just the metaphor. It's, it's, it's the vehicle. Yes. It's, it's not the message <laughs> itself. Right, right. What about you, Steve? Um, well, I, I don't think that fire walking is the only way that people can connect with the spirit and the heart and to move more gracefully through the world with, with, in, with a society of thinking. You know, I've, I know that there's spiritual practices, uh, meditation, meditation, maybe adopting a, a, 
a lifestyle that, that has mindfulness in it, breath work and so on. But I think that we are starting to, I think, come together with the mindfulness that we're creating. And so if we can bring fire walking to the people that who's, whose calling is for fire, then we're going to be serving the planet. And we've connected a lot with the breathwork community, with our work with Dan Brule, and we're finding that breath and fire are, are very connected. And so I, I see that, that that's going to get a greater connection in the next uh, five or six years. And we just need to, I think, open up all of our resources to, to people to give them the opportunity to connect with this elemental thing that we love as and introduce them maybe to other elements, but we just need to introduce more people, as many people as we can to it. And that's what, that's the way I think we're all on this call committed to doing. I, I like it. I like the, the combination of the air and the fire, right? Yeah. Uh, and it, it, these are very powerful forces right now and for us to actually be subservient to the power of this nature what it's telling us for us as a group of you know human beings to learn to listen more to care mm -hmm. for our world right and uh and in at the very very end the human soul on fire is actually going to you know change this world again any message last message from any one of you you know, thank you so much for coming to our world. I'd like anything that you wanted to share, uh, especially to the to the people of Asia, if you have anything to say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would like Asa. to say that Rolf and I that are elders in the uh, Western uh, firewalking community, we are so happy to see the young people who are coming to to be teachers. There is a new generation coming that is that will take over and to carry the knowledge about the fire to to coming generations and I found that very, very important. That is part of the fire walking community. And that is what I really love with the gatherings too, to see these people come together and share knowledge and uh, find uh, spirit to go out, inspiration to go out and uh, share it all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. Fire walking is a very, very old ritual. And it's, it's been and it is all over the world. Everywhere we go in the, in the world to, to do a fire walk, we try to connect with the local traditions of fire walking. And everywhere we go, we find not, not necessarily a local tradition of fire walking, but a local tradition of using fire for, for spiritual reasons. So this seems to be inherent in, in humans to have a relationship with fire, not just to heat their food and heat their houses and give them light, but also to give them light inside. And uh, so this, this will, I think, as long as there will be humans, this will, this will continue, this will go on. Now whether fire walking as such will get a bigger uh, place on the global stage, I don't know. I, uh, it, it may and it may not. It will always be there as a, as a river going through the human territory. But if it gets bigger and more acclaimed and celebrated, I'm not sure. But I know I want that. Because what fire walking gives to people is an understanding of the importance of following your heart. We have, this, we have this phrase, at least in Sweden, that people get burned out. And this is because they're not following their heart. They're way too much following what they think is their reason. And they have no balance between their reasoning, their intellectual capacities, and their heart. So they're not trusting their heart. And 
what fire walking does is it's opening up. It's opening up people's hearts because they have to make that decision. They cannot make that decision to walk on fire with their reasoning. They have to make it with their heart. So that's, you know, that's what we tell them at the fire walk. If you want to walk, listen to your heart. If your heart says yes, you're going to be fine. If your heart says no, don't walk. So everybody gets a connection with their heart at that moment. And a lot of people take that with them for the rest of their life. And so, yes, it would be fantastic. And I think that, that, it, that it had made, play, play, played, that fireworking played a bigger role in society on a global level. And I think one step that I'm working for in that direction is that all the firewalking schools come together on one level, on an umbrella level. Because every school, there are maybe four or five or six major firewalking schools, and every school has a, you know, a little um, perspective of their own, or, or an emphasis, I should say. Not a perspective, but they have an emphasis that differs. So every school trains their instructors a little bit differently, not when it comes to logistics so much and the safety, that's almost the same in every school. But, you know, what are you delivering? What is the message around the firewall? And if we can, if we can create a body, an organization, that is for all the schools to join in, in that organization and for no school to run and for no school to own, like we do at the firewalk and gathering, where everybody's welcome no matter. I think that would be a really beneficial step for us to make the make firewalking have a made bigger influence on the global stage. And in this respect I think Asia is really, really crucial. I th I feel we've been several times firewalking in Asia. And I feel there's such a, there's such a longing for for in Asia to to make a shift how they look on their traditions to be able to use their traditions that they have, especially the spirit traditions, spiritual traditions that are so strong in Asia, but also restricts people. I feel it, it bind, binds them down a bit. So to keep that fantastic spiritual um, energy that is in the Asian countries where we have been and combine it, that with a more personal freedom and a bigger emphasis on every, every person finding their own purpose and finding their own way, finding their decision road, that would, be, that would create just the energy that I think the firewalking movement needs if, if more people from Asia join join us. And I look forward to, you know, you coming back to Asia. We're supposed to actually meet in Sri Lanka, right? But uh, we didn't have that chance. But we will find the perfect time. There's always a perfect time for our energies to, it happens when know, it happens. to recombobulate. Yes. And I look forward to that. Uh, there's so much to look forward to. Okay. Steve and Barry. Um, one thing you mentioned too was, was about a, a message to people of the Philippines and I don't know if you're aware but here in the UK we have a special affinity with the Philippines and especially in the healthcare sector. Many, many um, Philippines come over to the UK and work in the NHS or work in the hospice care sector and so if there's a message it's a message of gratitude and thanks to your brothers and sisters over there and if we can help them they can reach out to us and we'll do whatever we can to help raise their spirits while they're raising the spirits of people over here who really need their help and that embodiment of care is obviously part of the psych and we love it and keep it and share it and if we can help you your fellow countrymen and women to share it let's do it 
that's so empowering to hear, right? And I receive on behalf of all the Filipino, you know, health workers in the UK uh, to receive that message of thanks on behalf of them. Uh, so thank you for the, you know, the generous words that will uplift our spirit. We'll continue serving, you know, in any way we can and uh, to actually merge our strengths and our spirits together to get through this uh, test we have the test of the human spirit, and I know we're all going to actually, you know, end up victorious here. Thank you for that touching message, Steve. Barry, anything? One of the things that, that has always struck me about the, the firewalking community is how inclusive they are. Uh, you know, I've, I've been involved in other communities where there was a lot of ego and a lot of... Um, division within the, the, the groups. But one thing about the firewalking community that I've, I've, it continues to amaze me is how inclusive they are and you know how nurturing and caring and supportive the, the community are regardless. You know, they, they, on the whole, they simply want what's best for the, their own people, their, their own groups, their own community and those that want to be part of the community. And so, you know, I would ex extend that invitation, you know, which Rolf touched on is regardless of what level you're at or where you've learned or what you've learned, if you want to connect with us, you know, the, the, this is, for me, I find it very much, it's, it's an open community that's open to all, for anyone with the right heart and the right spirit uh, to come and join us and be part of that community and you know that that's a global invitation uh, and, You know it was extended to me and I've, I've taken it up and and I continue to spread it. So yeah, come and get in touch We, we would welcome the contact Thank you and on behalf of a lot of people here in the Philippines and Asia we receive that energy and uh, Definitely, I will be helping in uh, expanding this level of energy, right, to reach to as many people as we can because we need this, especially at this point in time where the human soul is being tested. We need us to be forged in fire, to truly believe that, uh, you know, we can and we will be victorious in the end. But we need to listen to the message of this world, uh, to the message of Mother Nature to us, and come together and work together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to my brothers and sister in fire. Thank you for making this possible. Uh, I mean, this has been a very soulful conversation. Uh, I love that, you know, after a year, I see you all again. You know, uh, this doesn't feel virtual at all. I could feel your energies and your spirit. And I thank you. You are the elders of the fair walking community, people I look for, you know, I look up to. And I will always seek your advice. Uh, and I hope that the fair walking spirit continues to forge strong and that we will be a force of change uh, as more and more people uh, receive this message of hope and message of unity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming to Asia, coming to the Philippines. Uh, this is a very soulful conversation. I look forward to the day that you could come and visit me here or to the day that I could come and visit you there in the next Firewalk gathering, which is going to happen where? Spain. In Spain. Spain. Spain next year, I guess. Spain next year, right? Uh, Spain in November. We, we still hope. We still hope. Okay, Spain in November. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a spirit-filled conversation. I'm sure we're going to actually, you know, learn a lot from you. And you've given a lot of yourself to the people here in the Philippines. We need to receive this energy so that we could give more energy back. More energy back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Cherry. Thank you for having us. Great. Thank you. Thank you.